everyone and welcome to British Murders, a true crime podcast that focuses exclusively on British murder cases with an occasional glimpse at horror movies. I'm your host Stuart Blues and this is the Season 3 Special. Now right off the bat let me inform you that this is the first episode of a two-part series simply due to the sheer volume of information I need to get across in order to do this very sensitive case justice. Some people I know aren't keen on two-part episodes, but seeing as it is an end-of-season special, I'm sure you'll forgive me. This episode is also unique, as the original script and research for this case was done by my good friend Fern, who used to host an amazing podcast called Evidence of a Crime. Sadly, Evidence of a Crime is no longer an active podcast, but please do visit evidenceofacrime.co.uk to read some of Fern's recent articles, as that is what she's focusing on now. If you've never heard Fern's podcast, then it's worth pointing out that our styles are completely different, even though we're both from the North. She's North East and I'm from York, just so I'm better. I've therefore converted Fern's script into my own language so that as an audience, you're not completely thrown off. Or worse, expecting such high quality episodes going forward. This two-part series focuses on the highly preventable death of a six-year-old girl named Ellie Mae Butler. In this first episode, I'll discuss with you the events leading up to Ellie's death, and next week in part two, I'll discuss the events that occurred in the aftermath of Ellie's death. If you'd prefer to listen to the whole thing at once, it might be wise to skip this week's episode and just binge both of them in one go when part two is out next week. I don't often give content warnings on my show, as you know. Uh, Now this is a true crime podcast, so what do you expect? But I think this case does warrant one. As a father of a young girl who is reasonably close to Ellie's age, I must say that this was one hard case to read through and to look into. The case contains graphic details of child abuse, child neglect, and I'll be honest, some of you may find it extremely upsetting and disturbing, not just parents, but people in general. You have been warned. Before we get there, let's quickly do my opening icebreaker section, which I simply call Dad Facts. This is a portion of the show where I draw a random card out of a Father's Day pack my daughter got me a couple of years ago, which will contain a fact that every dad should know, and naturally, I know none of them. If you can hear me shuffling, it's not the best sound, is it? I'm sure you can. (laughs) You get the picture. I shuffle the cards. It's not biased, like I'm going to cheat on this. Anyway, dad facts. Here we go. Week four, I think. This one says... A Japanese toilet manufacturer once created a motorbike that ran on a biofuel created by human waste. (laughs) Oh, God. I mean, that takes gas station to the next level, doesn't it? Pumping for shit. I wonder how much that would cost per litre. Jesus Christ. I mean, uh, let's move on. These dad facts are, pardon the pun, shit. (laughs) Right. Now, usually at this point of the show, after my dad facts, I go into some history about the location of where the events took place, followed by a chronological sort of look at the story. Remember, though, I'm using an adapted script here from a very talented storyteller, unlike me, for this two-part special, so it may feel a little different to the usual nonsense content I provide. It's probably going to be a little bit better, a little bit more engaging. Hence, don't expect this quality going forward, please. The story takes place in South London, that's all you're getting this week. Now how many times have you turned on the news and heard a story about children being separated from the parents on the back of unsubstantiated allegations? It's worryingly common. Typically the parents who are able to be reunited with their children are unimaginably grateful that the nightmare has ended and they look to resume their lives as a family with serious lessons learned. In November 2012, a news story broke after Ben Butler began a relentless media campaign to win back custody of his daughter, Ellie Mae Butler. Initial allegations of abuse from Ben towards Ellie were dismissed and his name was cleared, however, Ellie still hadn't been returned to his care. The British public saw Ben as a doting father and they showed sympathy for the circumstances he'd found himself in. Ben appeared on the British TV show this morning as a loving father who was desperate to gain back the custody of his daughter. He appeared to be someone who'd had his name and reputation tarnished on the back of false accusations and the justice system had failed him. 
As the media campaign continued to gain attention, authorities began pandering to Ben. They catered to his every demand, basically in fear of repercussions from the general public. And as a result of this growing pressure, they neglected to think of the then five-year-old Ellie, an innocent little girl who was at the centre of it all. Let's take a step back though and look at the background of Ellie's parents, Ben Butler and Jenny Gray, who first got together in March 2006. Jenny was an aspiring actress and had appeared as an extra in well-known British TV shows such as the police drama The Bill and the soap opera EastEnders. She eventually secured a graphic design job in central London after giving up on her acting dream. Ben, in stark contrast, was a violent criminal. Five years earlier, in 2001, he was sentenced to three years in prison for armed robbery and the intimidation of a witness. In the years following his release, he was twice charged with assault. The first incident involved assaulting a man in the street, and the second involved the assault of his ex-girlfriend, who was pregnant at the time. Ben's violent outburst paired with Jenny's history of depression was a guaranteed recipe for disaster, but despite the red flags, the pair started their relationship after a meeting at a pub in Sutton, a town in the South London borough of Sutton. I know that sounds confusing, but the town itself is called Sutton and the borough in which it falls is also called Sutton. Good old English logic right there. Jenny fell pregnant pretty much straight away and the pair welcomed their daughter to the world on December 30th, 2006. They named her Ellie Mae Butler. Neil and Linda, Jenny's parents, didn't have the best relationship with their daughter, but they both attended Ellie's birth and were absolutely delighted at becoming grandparents. Ben and Jenny weren't even living together when Ellie was born and their relationship can only be described as being on again, off again. On February 7th, 2007, a five-week-old Ellie was taken to a local doctor. She had burns on both her forehead and her index fingers. It was when Ellie was in the care of her father that the burns had appeared, with Ben claiming that she had rolled off a pillow into a radiator as his back was turned. The doctor believed Ben's story and, as a result, opted not to make a referral to social services. As a parent of a toddler, I must admit that kids do sometimes hurt themselves in weird and creative ways. Often you think, Jesus, if someone sees what's happened, they won't even believe my ludicrous story, even though it's true. But it also makes you wonder how many times people fabricate those stories in order to cover up abuse suffered at their hands. On February 15th, 2007, a week later, Ellie was rushed into Epsom and St. Helier Hospital after becoming pale, limp and floppy. Once more, she'd been in Ben's care when this happened. Ben's story this time was that Ellie, who was only six weeks old at this point, had been placed into a car seat whilst he played video games on the computer. He looked over at Ellie a short while later and noticed that she'd slumped over. Just a quick note here for any new parents, please be careful leaving your children in seated positions, such as in car seats when you're not travelling in the car especially if your child doesn't have full control of their neck muscles yet and can't lift their head on their own. When they fall asleep, they can basically block their own windpipe when their head slumps forward, which can result in their sudden death. It may seem like an easy option, but please don't let your baby sleep in a car seat in your house, or even in the car for an extended period of time. The doctors at Epsom and St. Helier Hospital noted that Ellie didn't appear to have any outward signs of trauma, other than the burn on her head and fingers, which was noted the previous week by a local doctor. They very quickly realised though that Ellie displayed the symptoms of the three major injuries associated with shaken baby syndrome. Ellie had retinal hemorrhages, which means she was bleeding from the blood vessels in her retinas in her eye, a subdural hemorrhage, also known as subdural hematoma, a serious condition where blood collects between the skull and the surface of the brain, and she also had swelling on the brain. Her grandparents, Neil and Linda, were informed about Ellie's injuries and rushed to the hospital. Shockingly, that was the first time they met their granddaughter's father, Ben Butler. Neil recalls a consultant paediatrician informing the police and social services that Ellie was a shaken baby, and commented on how quickly the atmosphere changed. That's understandable as it's an extremely serious accusation. Ben soon became defensive and turned his anger onto the hospital staff as well as the police. 
he proclaimed his innocence. Ellie managed to make a full recovery in the week after the incident, but an investigation into her injuries had also begun. As a result, Ellie was removed from the hospital by social services and was no longer allowed to be cared for by either of her parents. That seems logical to me, at least until the investigation has run its course. Neil discussed that heartbreaking day in the documentary series Britain's Darkest Taboos. He explained how Linda and he spent as much time as they were allowed with Ellie while she was in the hospital and took as many pictures and videos as they could of their precious granddaughter. They had no idea when or even if they'd be able to see her again. You might be wondering what Ellie's mum Jenny thought about all this. She was obviously devastated, but she insisted that Ben was a fantastic father and believed he wouldn't have laid a finger on Ellie. Ben was subsequently arrested on suspicion of grievous bodily harm and released on bail whilst the investigation continued. On March 16, 2007, Ellie was placed with a foster family. Her grandparents were allowed to visit her once every two weeks, which must have been incredibly difficult for them to accept. It would have been even more difficult given that all contact with Ellie had to be supervised whilst the investigation was ongoing and they weren't even allowed to hold her without being shadowed. They also had to sign in and out of a timesheet. Not exactly something you plan on doing as a loving grandparent. Over time, Neil and Linda developed a relationship with Ellie's foster family and it became clear that they had nothing to do with her injuries. They loved Ellie more than anything else in the world. Neil and Linda eventually weighed up the possibility of them becoming Ellie's carers during the court process, a decision that was backed by both social services and Ellie's foster family. They were eventually granted custody of six-month-old Ellie on July 24th, 2007. They were both confident they could take care of her despite both being 61 and were overjoyed at the decision. In the background, Jenny continued to support Ben and took his version of events to mean the truth, despite there being overwhelming evidence with regards to what had happened to Ellie. Jenny's suitability as Ellie's carer was further brought into question, not only because of her support of Ben, but because neither Jenny nor Ben visited Ellie when she was in the care of Neil and Linda. Between July 2007 and March 2008, both parents were required to visit Ellie separately as they claimed they still weren't living together. During that period, at least 13 visits were cancelled by Jenny and many other times she would simply no-show. Neil said that Ben would call them on the phone late at night, around 9pm, when Ellie was obviously in bed, and he would demand to go to their house to visit his daughter. Neil and Linda, of course, refused, which would result in verbal abuse and threats from Ben. Linda did the smart thing and kept a log of all the abuse as evidence for social services. The sheer volume of abuse they received from Ben led them both to be convinced that he was indeed the one responsible for injuring Ellie when she was six weeks old. They no longer believed that Ellie would be safe if she was ever returned to Jenny and Ben's care. Remember, Jenny is their daughter, and they're still saying this about her. In January 2008, the local authorities presented their first fact-finding hearing to His Honour Judge Atkins. On January 28th, 2008, Judge Atkins concluded that Ben Butler had intentionally caused injuries to Ellie and that Jenny Gray had failed in her duty to protect her daughter. In March 2008, two months later, a consultant psychiatrist who had been commissioned to carry out independent psychiatric assessments on both Jenny and Ben reported his findings. He claimed that there were many inconsistencies between Ben's account of his assault on his pregnant ex-girlfriend and the serious nature of the police findings. That suggested Ben was lying about what happened. Ben said he had a temper, but there were no signs of a mental condition that would affect his behaviour. In Jenny's assessment, the psychiatrist claimed that she was not currently suffering from depression or a mental disorder, and that she had insisted that she was no longer intending to resume her relationship with Ben. After the analysis of Ben's criminal history and background information, the psychiatrist said, the potential risk of a child left unsupervised in his care is said to be high. He ended his report by saying, If any evidence of a closer relationship did emerge at any stage, given the level of risk posed by Ben Butler, I would have very significant concerns about Ellie. As the initial court proceedings came to an end, Jenny was ruled out as a suitable carer for Ellie. Neil and Linda then applied for a special guardianship in August 2008. 
According to grandparentsplus.org, a special guardianship order is a legal order where the court appoints a caregiver, usually a relative, as the special guardian of a child until they turn 18. The special guardian then shares parental responsibility for the child with the parents and can make nearly all the major decisions about the child without having to consult them. The special guardianship cannot be altered in any way by the parents without the permission of the court and gives relatives such as grandparents parental rights over the child so they cannot be undermined when making decisions. Neil and Linda were awarded special guardianship a short while later and Neil says that they finally had some stability as a family knowing they'd be able to see how they grow up. This story is so sad honestly as Neil and Linda appeared to do everything right for the benefit of Ellie and her future. She was a happy, vibrant, bubbly, smart little girl who was thriving in their care. She had no further injuries and started to grow up in the loving home every child deserves. In March 2009, two years after Ellie's shaken baby syndrome injuries occurred, Ben's criminal trial began. Judge Timothy Shaw oversaw the proceedings and it was left to a jury to determine whether or not Ben intentionally harmed Ellie. After being presented with the evidence, which to be honest was more than overwhelming, the jury found Ben guilty of grievous bodily harm or GBH. He was sentenced to serve 18 months in prison, though he still protested his innocence and began appealing his conviction almost immediately. In September 2009, six months after Ben's sentencing, Jenny gave birth to another child. The identity of said child is going to remain anonymous throughout this two-part series. Jenny concealed her pregnancy from everyone and eventually fled to Portsmouth in South East England with a false identity in an attempt to retain custody of her new baby. A few weeks later, Ben was released from prison whilst his appeal was underway. On February 7th, 2010, Jenny was arrested in Portsmouth for, what do you think? Any guesses? Shoplifting. Probably from the pound shop. At the time, she was still using a false identity and had the young baby in her care. It took almost a month for authorities to track her down. It was noted that a six-month-old baby was found to be wearing filthy clothes and displayed signs of parental neglect. The child was removed from her care instantly and placed into police protection. These poor kids, man. It's worth noting during that time that neither Jenny nor Ben attempted to make contact with Ellie. The only people poor Ellie knew as parents were Neil and Linda, her maternal grandparents. Ben Butler's conviction was quashed in June 2010 by Lord Justice Moses on the basis of new medical evidence. Lord Moses, a Court of Appeal judge, claimed that Ellie's full recovery would not have been possible if she was shaken severely and that the jury were not presented with enough evidence to consider an alternative explanation for her injuries. Lord Moses said, Nowhere in his ruling did Judge Timothy Shaw fully acknowledge the weight to be attached when discussing parts of the evidence. He described the judge making a continuance of misdirections to the jury and claimed, No proper direction was given to the jury that they must consider the possibility of an unknown cause and should only convict if they reject it. As a result, Lord Moses overturned Ben Butler's conviction. Ben, thrilled at being let off the hook, used his overturned conviction to his advantage and conducted several media interviews discussing how he'd been wronged. He also stated that he planned to take the police and social services to court for wrongfully accusing him. Ben said, It was horrendous. It's still difficult to talk about. They sent me to a vulnerable prisoner's prison. I was put with sex offenders. I never spoke to the guy I shared a cell with. It's like being put in a mental hospital when you're not mental. It was just a horrible, dirty feeling where everyone is on a different wavelength. These three and a half years are being horrendous. I can't believe that it's taken so long to clear my name. I can't believe so much money has been wasted on prosecuting an innocent person when there was so much evidence that it wasn't a shaken baby case. Despite his claims of innocence, Ben found himself back in court not long after his conviction was overturned as he pleaded guilty to assaulting a man in a takeaway. Jenny was then found guilty of claiming unemployment benefits whilst working. She had also been admitted to hospital 16 times in an 8 month period between 2010 and 2011 for a variety of injuries. 
Jenny also learned during that period that her youngest child was ill, but despite knowing this, she still didn't bother to visit. Although Ben's conviction had now been overturned and he was no longer considered responsible for harming Ellie by law, Jenny and he were still deemed unfit to care for their daughter due to the conclusion of the original fact-finding hearing. Ben then decided to take on Neil and Linda in an attempt to regain custody of Ellie. He received legal aid of over £1 million to fight Ellie's grandparents, who she saw as her actual parents. Jenny and Ben accused Neil and Linda of not taking good care of Ellie, and they alleged Ellie was not dressed in the right clothes and that her diet was unbalanced. Neil and Linda had to use their life savings to fight their side of the story and to ultimately protect their granddaughter. Sutton Council Social Services were then removed from the case and a private firm called Services for Children, with the number four in the middle, were brought in to assess Jenny and Ben's ability to look after Ellie. That decision was made to alleviate the hostility between local authorities, Ellie's grandparents and Ellie's parents. However, it was the first major mistake. Services for Children, or S4C, a private firm, were totally unaware of the events that had taken place over the previous five years. They only had access to a limited amount of information during their assessment. S4C relied heavily on the narrative provided by Jenny and Ben, and as a result became hostile towards Neil and Linda. Not exactly an independent or unbiased adjudicator by the sounds, and extremely unprofessional. In an interview with The Guardian, Neil discussed the treatment and accusations he and his wife faced from S4C. He said, They told us that Ellie was doing too many activities at school and it wasn't good for her, and we tried to explain that the activities are what every normal little child does. The private social workers, S4C, continually criticised and tried to demoralise Linda and I, that we weren't doing a good job, and if we complained we were troublemakers and for that nearly 18 months we had all this. Social service were fighting us on one side, the parents was fighting us on another side, and at the end of the day, all that mattered, really, was Ellie. This continued and continued until we lost Ellie. Neil claims that at that point, Jenny and Ben hadn't seen Ellie for years. They were strangers to her, and he and his wife had extensive proof that both parents had never shown an interest in Ellie at all, and was still failing to show up for supervised contact visits. Whilst the custody battle was ongoing, Ben also began threatening Neil and Linda with physical assaults. He told them to watch over their shoulders. Both Jenny and Ben wanted Neil to consult with them before ever speaking to his solicitor, but he refused. The hope as far as Neil and Linda were concerned was that this, along with Ben's history of violence and the neglect proven in the case of Jenny and Ben's youngest child, that they would have nothing to worry about when it came to a legal battle. But they were wrong. The story will continue after these messages. And now back to the story. In May 2012, the case was presented in the High Court to Justice Mary Hogg, a judge who had made a string of controversial decisions in the years since she had been appointed. By then, Neil and Linda had used up all £70,000 of their savings to fight their corner and no longer had legal representation. Because of that, they attended court as simply bystanders. The case against Ben was presented again, with numerous professionals called to the stand to give their medical opinion on Ellie's injuries. The burn injuries Ellie had sustained were dismissed due to naive parenting on her father's part and the focus was mainly on the injuries associated with shaken baby syndrome. The experts argued that Ellie's recovery from the retinal hemorrhages was extremely unusual for a shaken baby case, given that Ellie was left with no residual damage, something they noted as being extremely rare. The medical experts also disagreed on whether the blood shown on Ellie's medical scan could have been fresh blood mixed with spinal fluid from shaking, or from an old injury, possibly caused at birth, which had continued to bleed. An alternative theory was then presented by consultant psychiatrist Professor Fleming. When Ellie was admitted to hospital at seven weeks old, doctors noticed a cyst in the back of her throat. The theory was that the cyst, along with reflux, caused Ellie to stop breathing, resulting in her brain swelling. Professor Fleming argued that the sudden increase of pressure had caused the retinal hemorrhages 
and her father rapidly lifting her out of a car seat to place her on the bed may have caused the bleed on her brain. Much to his surprise, Neil was called to the stand to clarify his relationship with his daughter Jenny and her violent partner. Neil told the court that he hated both of them and was convinced they had intentionally harmed his granddaughter. The hearing lasted eight weeks and as it came to a close, Justice Mary Hogg delivered her ruling. Are you ready for this? She said, I do not blame him for causing injury to Ellie. While I accept that he may have done so with all good intention to help her, I hope everyone will accept that I do not attach any culpability to him and that in my judgment he is exonerated from causing her any inflicted injury. I accept that he can act out of frustration, but that does not necessarily mean he will lose control of his temper, however fleetingly, towards his baby daughter. All professionals are to proceed on the basis that neither parent poses any physical risk to Ellie. How wrong she would be. She added, The last five and a half years must have been an extraordinarily difficult time for the parents. They have weathered the storm. They have been resilient and determined and shown tenacity and courage. I hope now that the record is put straight, that with their tenacity they will be able to put behind them those difficulties and look forward to a more positive future. I wish the parents well. They too deserve joy and happiness. <laughs> I can barely get through this, guys, honestly, it's a joke. It is seldom that I see a happy end in public law proceedings. It is a joy for me to oversee the return of a child to her parents. The story does not end here. There is still work to be done. No fucking shit the story doesn't end here. My God. When you, honestly, I, I can barely get through that. When you hear what happened and you listen to those words by a high court appeal judge, it's just embarrassing. Neil and Linda's special guardianship was now meaningless and the little girl they'd essentially been parents to for the last five years was about to be returned into an environment which they both knew was unsafe and put her at severe risk of further harm. Neil said to Judge Hogg that he hopes she has a conscience because one day she will have blood on her hands. He asked for that comment to be placed on the record. Again, how right he would be, sadly. Neil and Linda were then stripped of their rights to an opinion on Ellie's welfare and they were left completely powerless. Local authorities were then required by court to send out a formal notice of Ben Butler's exoneration to all agencies who were involved in supporting Ellie's welfare. Despite Ellie remaining in their care during that time, Neil and Linda were totally unaware. The letter stated the following. Lady Justice Hogg concluded that not only was she satisfied that Ben Butler had never caused harm to his child, in fact, there was an innocent explanation for his child's suspected injuries. Services for children then began trying to mediate between Ellie's parents and grandparents to make the transition of Ellie returning home as smooth as possible. That being said, the level of hostility between the two couples was growing at a rapid rate. Services for Children initially hoped that Ellie would be able to spend time in the custody of both couples, but they quickly realised that they would never come to an amicable agreement. Ben became increasingly frustrated at the lack of access to his daughter, and a plan was put in place to return Ellie to her parents and lone sibling as quickly as possible to protect her from any family tension. According to the Serious Case Review, Jenny and Ben's youngest child was introduced back into the home slowly within the following weeks. The review notes that Ben was the leading parent for all of the introductions in the home due to Jenny attending a training course at work despite promising that she would free herself of all work commitments. Jenny failed to do so and when authorities challenged her on why she was not around to welcome her youngest child home, she became evasive. Authorities also noted that the gas and electric was off inside the house and the youngest child's bed was not yet assembled. The youngest child was officially placed back into the care of Jenny and Ben on October 8th, 2012. On October 19th, 2012, 11 days later, Ben made his first official TV appearance on This Morning in an interview conducted by Irish broadcaster Eamon Holmes and his wife and fellow TV presenter Ruth Langsford. Fun fact, I've actually met Eamon Holmes. My dad was on the National Lottery Jet Set TV show back in the day and he won a holiday to Zambia. On his second attempt though. Naturally it was a couple's holiday so I wasn't invited but I'm not bitter. 
Not one bit. I met Eamon backstage at a National Lottery broadcast. Nice guy. Anyway, back to Ben Butler. He talked to Eamon and Ruth about the horrors of being falsely accused and the battle to clear his name. He said, The nightmare doesn't end. The mistakes that were made we will pay for the rest of our lives. It's the old adage of no smoke without fire from some people. With Jenny sat by his side, she claimed that she'd never suspected Ben of causing Ellie's injuries and said, if anything, he was just trying to be the perfect dad. The pair spoke of how excited they were to be reunited with their daughter and the compelling performance led to sympathy from the entire nation. In a post on this morning's Facebook page, members of the public left comments such as the government make me sick and they should be looking for people who hurt their kids, not this poor couple. Glad they won their kids back. Hindsight, hindsight, hindsight. This just proves that you shouldn't believe everything you hear and how crucial it is to wait until you know all of the facts before forming an opinion on something. Just days after their appearance on TV, begging for their daughter to finally be returned, Services for Children arranged a contact visit between Ellie and her birth parents on the first weekend of November 2012. Ellie was to spend the day with her parents and stay the night, but when the weekend came around, Jenny and Ben moved into a new home together and were again without electricity. Services for children were unable to get in contact with either parent. Eventually, Jenny and Ben both admitted that they were unprepared for Ellie's arrival back home. In a November 2012 report, Services for children claimed, the cancellation of Ellie's contact on the weekend of November 4th was not prioritising Ellie and her feelings. However, the overwhelming stress of the situation meant that for a brief period, Ellie got lost in it all. How many times do these two need to show that they're unfit parents? It truly baffles me how many excuses they came up with and got away with. Some people just shouldn't be parents. Despite concerns from Ellie's school and paediatrician about the quickening pace of the transition, the move was set to go ahead on November 9th, 2012. Neil said that social workers arrived at his home that morning and informed Linda and him that they would be the ones taking Ellie to school. Neil and Linda said absolutely not. They insisted they would be giving Ellie a breakfast as usual and taking her to school themselves. The couple were allowed to take Ellie to school, but they were both absolutely devastated. They couldn't even tell Ellie what was happening. As they dropped her off at school that morning, they told her how much they loved her and explained how they'd always be there for her. Neil said that social services had only told Ellie she was going for a sleepover at her parents' house, which obviously she believed. She had no idea what was actually about to happen. Neil said, It's as though your life has caved in. We spent nearly six years looking after a little girl who we loved, who loves us. I can't even begin to imagine how heartbreaking that must have been for Neil and Linda. Not only to think you'll never see your granddaughter you've practically raised again, but to know she's going back into the care of two dangerous individuals. The following is a timeline of events that took place after Ellie was placed back in the care of Jenny and Ben. All of the information can be found within the serious case review which is in this episode's references. A mere four days after Ellie was returned to her parents, Jenny and Ben called services for children with some concerns. They insisted that Neil and Linda hadn't been taking care of Ellie properly, and that she was extremely upset as she believed she would be going home. They stated that Ellie was lying frequently and telling tales of a younger sibling. She was also allegedly fussy about eating, let's face it, most kids are at times, and saying no to everything. This is nothing new as a parent, let me tell you. These guys wouldn't know though because basically they haven't been one for five, six years. Jenny and Ben even described Ellie as an odd child on one occasion. Remember, this young girl was only five years old when they said that and she'd just been torn away from the only loving parent she'd ever known without warning. On December 4th, 2012, Jenny arrived at St. Helia Hospital with both Ellie and her sibling. They were both hungry and given food by one of the nurses on shift. Jenny was then informed that social services would be made aware of her visit and she quickly gathered up the children and left. Red flag alert or what? She returned later that day on her own and it was revealed that she was once again pregnant. It probably won't surprise you when I say Jenny said she wanted to keep the pregnancy a secret from both Ben and her family. On January 5th, 2013, 
Jenny was admitted to hospital for gynaecological investigations. Her youngest child was admitted on social grounds after Jenny expressed that there was nobody else who could take care of them. She didn't mention she had another child, that being Ellie. The hospital grew suspicious after discovering that Jenny had provided false details, and after locating her correct information, nurses informed social services that Jenny was exhibiting bruising. Services for children then began an investigation into Ellie's whereabouts and discovered that she was not at home or at school. When they conducted a home visit, Ben became aggressive and would not cooperate with the social workers. Finally, they discovered that Jenny had taken Ellie to Portsmouth. She claimed they were spending a few days with one of Jenny's friends for a break. It was around that time that Services for Children also noted difficulties in the parents' relationship and were informed that they had separated. Services for Children also discovered that Ellie had missed many medical appointments throughout the starting months of 2013 and that her attendance at school was extremely poor since moving back with her parents. Jenny and Ben had also accrued rent arrears and Jenny had continued to attend hospital for a variety of different injuries. In March 2013, Jenny was admitted to Chelsea and Westminster Hospital with bleeding following the termination of her pregnancy. She again provided false information to the nurses, claiming to not have any other children and denied ever being in the hospital previously. Fortunately, one of the staff members recognised her and alerted the police immediately. The police conducted emergency welfare checks on the children on March 31st, 2013. At first, nobody answered the door, but when they returned a short while later, they discovered Ben and both of the children. They reported that the children were safe and well, and that no concerns were held. On April 4th, 2013, as Jenny was being discharged from hospital, a nurse called the multi-agency safeguarding hub to report her suspicions that Jenny had been raped. There was no evidence to substantiate those claims and so services for children didn't believe putting in any safeguarding procedures with regards to the children would be necessary. What a great company, eh? A senior practitioner for Sutton Children's Social Care was then asked to consider whether an assessment or intervention should be undertaken. After liaising with services for children, they concluded that there was no evidence to justify a formal investigation. During the period in which Ellie had been in Jenny and Ben's care, the pair had been extremely hostile with social services. They were often unreachable, and any contact made with the pair usually ended in aggression on Ben's part. Neil and Linda were also struggling with the lack of contact they were able to have with Ellie. They attempted to arrange regular contact meetings, but Jenny and Ben would often cancel at the last minute, using Ellie as a weapon to further Neil and Linda's suffering. Two months later, in June 2013, Ellie was taken to a local doctor's with bruises and grazing on her face. Ben attended the appointment with her and Ellie described that it was an accident. She said she'd fallen over. The doctor believed Ellie's version of events and no further questions were asked. On the morning of Sunday, October 27th, 2013, Jenny called her parents, Neil and Linda. She asked if they wanted to see Ellie at McDonald's in Sutton for half an hour and Neil and Linda jumped at the chance. They hadn't seen Ellie for nearly six weeks, and when they arrived, they were shocked to see what state she was in. Her hair was matted, her clothes were filthy and crumpled, and she had bruises on her face. Neil asked if he could take some pictures of Ellie, and Jenny replied, Yeah, carry on, I don't care anymore. That's nice, isn't it? Jenny appeared to have given up, and Ellie seemed rather nervous. Every time Ellie spoke, her mum would glare at her. Neil said it was obvious what the issue was. After half an hour, Jenny led Ellie away from the fast food restaurant. Ellie kissed her grandparents goodbye, told them she loved them, waving as she disappeared out of sight. Neil and Linda always felt like something terrible was just around the corner, but they clung on to the hope that Ellie would one day be returned to their care. They had no idea that their last-minute visit to McDonald's would be the last time they would see their precious granddaughter alive. Looking back on the day he found out about Ellie's death, Neil said in his interview with The Guardian, On the 29th, which was a Tuesday evening, there was a knock at the door. It was a young police lady. She said, I've some bad news. Straight away, Linda jumped. She said, it's nothing to do with Ellie. They said yes. 
We invited the lady in and she explained that, as we've had Ellie for five and a half years, we feel that you should know that she's passed away. We've arrested the parents and it's a homicide. That concludes the end of part one regarding the tragic case of Ellie Butler. Next week in part two, I will be discussing the details of Ellie's brutal murder, the trial of Ben Butler and Jenny Gray, and the horrifying revelations that came to light in the years following Ellie's death. Thanks again to Fern from Evidence of a Crime for all the hard work you put into researching this case. For more on British murders, please check out my social media channels and YouTube. Merchandise is available to purchase at Teespring. You can support the show on Patreon and buy me a coffee. Keep your case suggestions coming in to me at britishmurderspodcast at gmail.com or via social media. Thank you to everyone who submitted a case suggestion so far. I do plan to have them in my season four. So if you do submit a case, I will put it in the seasons and I will give you a shout out as well. So please keep reaching out. And finally, reviews of the show can be left on iTunes and Podchaser. For now, I've been Stuart Blues. This has been British Murders. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time, cheerio.